All right, here we go. Bononi. So d4, knight f6, c4. So the normal Bononi move would be c5, but um, but this move order can lead to this type of stuff. Knight c3, ed, cd, d6, e4, g6, f4, bishop g7, and bishop b5. And this is kind of sharp. So instead, they do this move order. So you wait for white to, uh, to either play g3 or knight f3 here. And then if white tries to transpose into it knight c3, then black will just play here. But in this game, see g3, so now black's okay with playing the Benoni. So he plays the Benoni right away. Okay, so white can transpose into an English-type formation here with knight f3. But to keep it a true Benoni, uh, you play d5. Because then this structure leads to Benoni. So d5, e, d, c, d. Why he waits for it? It's just an opening little theoretical thing. Because that original variation I showed you is very sharp and probably better for white. So this way you wait for white to commit to a move before you decide to engage in the Benoni. And like I said, if white ends up playing knight c3, you can just play bishop b4 and transpose into a Nimzo Indian. Okay, so d6. Okay, so this is the main Benoni structure here. So you have this advanced pawn on d5, but black has good dark square control. So bishop's going to go to g7, and this, these dark squares are going to be under black's control. But white has more space, because this pawn is on the, on the fifth rank, so these squares are controlled, so it's hard for this knight to get out. Okay, so what's going on here? So what's, what's, what's white's plan here? What if white moves to d6? Well, that's why black plays d6. That's why black plays d6, to stop that. So what's white's plan here? So white's plan is to get this in eventually. And secondarily to attack this pawn, because this is a weakness in black's position. So those are his two plans. And black's plan is what? Black's plan is to mobilize these pawns, because you have a queenside majority, three versus two. I often talk to you guys about the queenside majority, so he's going to try to mobilize these pawns as soon as possible. But also stop white from doing this pawn to e5. So he has to simultaneously get his queenside pawns rolling whilst also curtailing white's plan. So Benoni is difficult to play because it's difficult to juggle those two. White's plan is more straightforward because oftentimes getting this pawn moved e5 in also works well with, in conjunction with attacking this pawn. So let's see how they do it. So this is still the opening, knight c3, g6. So you want to develop this bishop along this diagonal, like I, like I said, to control these squares. Knight f3, bishop g7, bishop g2, castle, castle. Okay. So why is white posting his bishop on this square? So first of all, this white, this bishop is now controlling these two squares. So rather than being like on this diagonal, say, whoops, that's a bad arrow. But say if it was on this diagonal, it really doesn't, it's not really doing anything. Whereas on this diagonal, it's kind of seeing over this square and, and this square. So it, it helps prepare e4. And also, once you eventually play e4 to e5, this bishop will already be protecting this pawn. Whereas if this bishop was, say, on d3, not only is this queen not defending this pawn because the bishop's in the way, but also, when you play d5, or sorry, e5, this pawn is no longer protected. So, and another reason to do this is sometimes white plays e4, f4, and e5. Like, he needs to get f4 in to get e5 in, and that weakens the king. 
but having this bishop here kind of helps protect the king. Because if the bishop was, say, on c4 or d3 or something, the king would be missing a defender. So this bishop helps to protect the king. So black plays knight a6. Common maneuver in the Benoni. So the ideas are either to play c4 and knight c5, or sometimes to play knight c7, attack this pawn, and then go for a quick b5. But since this knight can't go to this natural square, it goes here. And sometimes even you can play knight b4 and attack this pawn this way. So there's a variety of things you can do, but, uh, but knight a6 is most common. So yeah, a common plan is c4 and knight c5, because then this knight gets this nice square. So, uh, I mean, it's also possible to play knight here, or here, or rook here. So rook here plans to stop this advance by putting pressure on this file. a6 plans to play a quick b5. And knight bd7 plans to either hop this knight to b6 or to e5. So those are also other lines. But he played knight a6. Yeah, a5 is a very bad blunder, positionally. Because now you're giving up control of this square. You want to be able to play b5 at some point. And now you're never going to be able to play b5. So now you have no queenside play whatsoever. So a5 is a very bad positional blunder. You don't want to play that. So that, that's why one of the main moves is a6, so that you can play b5. But you need to get these queenside pawns rolling. And having pawns on a5 and c5 means this b5 square is a big hole. So after I play a4, you have no queenside play. And I'm, I'm just going to play e4 and e5. You're not going to be able to stop me. So, okay, so you play knight a6. So, uh, what's, what, what do you think white should do here? Okay, all of you guys, all of you guys need to pay attention to this because if you guys ever find yourself in these structures, you guys are all making moves that are very incongruous with this structure. With this structure, if Spinal Tap were here, he would definitely know the right move because he just showed it to us earlier today. But you guys have to pay close attention to this because this is important. So the act, the main move here is actually this move. Can you tell me why? Not, it's not because I can move my F pawn. Yeah. I mean, it's part of it, but not the main reason. Yeah, so Yerand is right. So the point is, you're supporting E4. Because if you play E4 immediately, the problem is this bishop can trade itself for this knight. So rather than this knight being here, you want it away from the pin. So that's one idea. Another idea is that, yeah, this knight's heading for this square. And from this square, it controls this square and this square. Exactly the two ideas I was talking about. Attacking d6 and supporting an e5 advance. So from knight c4, you, now you can play e4, e5 quite, quite readily. And this knight is, is well placed on c4. Blockades this pawn, attacks this weak pawn on d6. So you have to ask yourself, are my pieces in good positions? And this piece while it's developed on a normal square, is really looking at squares that are defended. It's much better to place the knight on this square. So it's okay that you have to move backwards to do it, because, you know, there's no, there's no real issue of development or initiative or tempo here. You can take some time to get your pieces to the best squares. So, yeah. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, the problem is this bishop doesn't know where it wants to go yet. This rook doesn't know where it wants to go yet. This rook may want to stay on the f-file, because if you're going to play e4, f4, and e5, this f-file actually might be the open file after pawn takes, pawn takes. So you might not need the rook on the e-file to support e5. You might actually want the rook on the f-file. So it's more a question of which pieces you know where they want to go. Like, in this position, the only thing you know for sure is that you want your knight to get to this square. Because it's clearly better on c4 than on f3. It, it opens this f-pawn for a possible push. It opens this bishop so it defends this pawn. And you're attacking the d6-pawn. So any other move really kind of get, tips your hand too much. Because remember, white's two plans are to play for e4, e5, or to attack this pawn. And with knight d2 to c4, you're not, you're not tipping your hand right away. If you're playing rook e1, it's pretty clear that you're going to be playing e4 and e5. And then black can actually focus his efforts on stopping it. But if you play knight d2 and you try to focus me on stopping e4, e5, I'm probably just going to win this pawn because you're not going to have enough defense for it. So you want to be flexible as much as possible. So it's a very subtle difference, but flexibility is, is often key. The more flexible you are, the easier it is you can switch plans, and the harder it will be for your opponent to meet it. So, yeah. So like I said, if e4 right away, then you allow this bishop g4 idea. And trading this bishop for this knight is a good trade for black, because now these squares are going to be firmly under black's control. It'll be hard, for example, to evict a knight from d4 if a knight should get there, or even a knight from e5. So anyway. Knight d2 is the normal move. But why play h3 here? So does h3 make any sense? Yes or no? Okay. So, h3. Yeah, so this is actually not the theoretical main move, but it does have a basis in logic, uh, which is it does stop bishop g4, so now you can get e4 in one move. And also, oftentimes, in this position, this knight will use the g4 square to get to e5. So a knight g4, e5 idea. So h3 stops that as well. So it's a modest move, but it does have a positional basis. So it also gives your king you know, a room to run if need be. But that's the strategy. So again, it's another way to stay flexible. So you're not really committing to anything right away. So now it's not clear whether you're going to play e4 right away. You could still play knight e2 to c4. It's kind of a waiting move, but it, it, it has you know, basis. It's not completely without uh, a reason. So it's not just like, oh, because I want to push a pawn. You know, it, it has a very sound reasoning. Okay. So now I'm going to give you three choices for black, and you tell me which one you think is the best. So the three choices are either knight c7, bishop d7, or rook e8. So which one of those three do you think is the best? I'll give you guys a minute or two to think about it. 